Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to panel five, Making Memory in Civic Space. So we have three excellent speakers uh, lined up for this panel, and we're going to take them in the order that they appear in the programme. So first up, we have Dee Maher Ring of TU Dublin, and her title is Unseen Signs, Illuminating Ireland's Undocumented Graphic Heritage. Dee Maher Ring is passionate about vernacular letter forms, the decline of Kilkenny's rich heritage of hand-painted fascia signs drove her to question their value as design heritage. Her research interests lie at the intersection of design, craft and heritage, leading to her upcoming PhD studies here at TU Dublin. So Dee, I'll uh, hand over to you now. Uh, thank you to Marianne, Nivan, and Mel for inviting me to speak here today. Um, vernacular shopfront lettering is an intrinsic part of our visual and cultural heritage, though it's under immediate threat post pandemic. And academic examination of Ireland's fascia signs is critical before they vanish from our streetscapes. Witnessing the decline of these letter forms, along with the homogenization and steady erosion of Kilkenny's high street character, which is my hometown, inspired this research project. These signs are largely unseen. Since 1999, the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage state initiative has been tasked with identifying, recording and evaluating the post-1700 architectural heritage of Ireland. Despite documenting Ireland's shopfronts of historical significance, the signage component is largely overlooked. To address this gap, I had an idea to develop a methodology for capturing, classifying and appraising the vernacular facial letter forms to value them as a significant element of our built heritage, to better understand their position in terms of our graphic heritage. In August 2020, I mooted the idea in a letter to Minister for Heritage, Malcolm Noonan. In 2021, the Kilkenny Traditional Shopfront Signage Project, or the KTSSP, pilot study of 50 shopfronts was commissioned by Dervla Ledwidge, Heritage Officer at Kilkenny County Council. It was funded by the Council and Creative Ireland. Incredibly, due to government travel restrictions at the time, I was unable to conduct field work in the initial stages and instead had to work from a collection of images from a previous project in 2019 conducted by Trevor Finnegan. So come with me and I'll take you on a tour of some fascia signs in the medieval city of Kilkenny, which was once the capital of Ireland. Kilkenny's historic shop fronts were commonly inserted circa 1900, though this one is dated um, around 1800. This unit at 84 High Street that adjoins Kilkenny's historic town hall, which was built circa 1695, lay vacant from 2017 until it was occupied by Café Nero in May of this year. The sign of white sans serif capital letter forms with navy outline and distinctive cornered counters on vibrant blue fascia board was hand painted by the renowned Dublin sign writer Colm O'Connor. Pictured here are my dad, deep, my dad and uh, Colm deep in conversation about all things sign painting. The NIH states that this building was extensively renovated with replacement shared shop front inserted to ground floor, though no date is given. Interestingly, just days before the photo was taken, this sign had been painted by Colm O'Connor in the customary Café Nero black lettering with copper outer stroke, but at the company's request, it was repainted in the current colour scheme. Admittedly, this hand-painted lettering made my heart sing, as previous fascia signs had been plastic since at least 2011 when it was lifestyle sports. The streets of Kilkenny 
1950s uh, to 1980s, a Kilkenny Archaeological Society study published in the Old Kilkenny Review is now available digitally and provides an excellent social history resource. P.T. Murphy at 85 High Street, just a couple of units on from Cafe Nero. Um, this shop front and sign was created by the skilled artisans of Kilkenny Woodworkers Company. Now, the KTSSP audit data sheets recorded the NIH details of front and sign verbatim. This entry states glazed fascia having brass lettering, but contradictorily, sorry, it continues. Of particular additional importance is the finely detailed shop front of artistic design interest, displaying high quality craftsmanship, representing the last surviving frontage executed by Kilkenny Woodworkers Company. It now reads a shop front signed by the Kilkenny uh, Woodworkers, closed 1921. As the name suggests, the Kilkenny Woodworkers were noted for their exquisite carpentry. And I noted um, at the time of the audit that it was incised and gilded wood. And I've also learned that it's been regilded over the years by the members of the Quigley family, a Kilkenny sign writing dynasty. A rather poignant en entry on Murphy's uh, Facebook page on St. Patrick's Day in 2020, P.T. Murphy's founder kept the doors open during the fight for independence and civil war. Before that, the Great War and then the flu pandemic and recession that followed. His daughter Frances and husband Damon took over the running of the business at the onset of the Second World War. Business in a time of uncertainty and fear is nothing new to Murphy Jewellers, and we're going to get through this just like our predecessors did. A quick sidestep off High Street now and onto Friary Street, where the facial lettering of Ryan's pub has long since been a stalwart of this streetscape. The unusual metal letter forms on this fascia had always intrigued me. They seem slightly out of character with the styles encountered in Kilkenny City and the, the environs. They were somewhat of a mystery until I got a copy of Alan Bartram's facial lettering in the British Isles. Leafing through the pages of this wonderful publication, I realised it contained examples from all around Ireland. Even more surprising, it had photos of signs from New Ross, County Wexford, a mere 15 minutes from my front door. Bartram mentions that this Victorian cast iron letter, um, stock letter, must have been the most popular of all. It had certainly survived any longer than any uh, sur survived longer than any other. In 1862, Mark Saracen Foundry in Glasgow registered it, not at all vernacular. He continues to list the various buildings where he had encountered this letter form in the UK and Ireland, including a post office in Bantry and two further Irish examples from Cashel in County Tipperary and Cahar Daniel in County Kerry. Next, we're moving on to the parade and to number 16, Rose Inn Street. In 2016, after 44 years of trading, Paddy White's butchers closed their doors. Over the last seven years, many businesses have operated from here, but it's also uh, lain vacant. My survey photo, which we see here, shows the Mokum Christmas Emporium painted acrylic aluminium fascia sign with a banner for form pop pop-up shop across the front. The remains of the Murphy's ice cream shop sign still linger below the historic raised letter forms of Victualler that surprisingly are mentioned in the NIH record. Fascia to first floor with raised le lettering and decorative frame. I cannot help but one wonder, should another NIH survey be conducted, would the same reference be afforded to the acrylic raised letters of ice cream that knows where it's coming from? These letters have undoubtedly left their mark on this historic building facade. Google Maps Historical Street View offers an excellent source of archival images showing the various iterations of this shop from 2009. Though not without its problems, because you can see Kilkenny Cats Courier deliver, delivery service, and no matter what way I went at it, I couldn't get a clear view of that. But uh, the wonderful white butchers carved gilded and reverse glass gilded lettering, a constant on this streetscape until 2016. 
In the NIAH, it says uh, it's a modest scale house distinguished in Rose Inn Street by a robust render, render dressings of artistic design significance, exhibiting high quality craftsmanship. I sincerely hope that this high quality craftsmanship remains hidden, protected behind the digitally output sign. At 2223 Rosen Street is the Turkish restaurant Anatolia. The NIEH record reads a fine shop front of artistic design importance exhibiting high quality craftsmanship further enlivens the street presence of the house at street level. At the beginning of this research journey, I somewhat naively thought that being on the NIEH afforded full protection. These archival images come from the Kilkenny Digital archive shop fronts through the ages repository, a rich resource that charts both shop front and signage changes of Kilkenny thoroughfares in some instances over 30 years. The first image shows the original raised letters from the digital archive where the date is unknown. The next image, if it comes up, is 1994. The next one is 2011 when Spar took it over. The next is Cafe 22 in 2019. To the audit image that was taken in August of last year. Which shows Anatolia Cafe and Restaurant. Worryingly, the final image shows the current signage that was installed approximately three months following the completion of this audit. And this is what we see here. Preliminary research had identified a gap in council policy. Fortunately, the survey findings and recommendations contained in the final report are to be discussed with the Forward to Planning Department at Kilkenny County Council in the coming weeks. Halfway down this street is another vacant unit. Like most of the original historic shop fronts in Kilkenny, it too was inserted into the ground floor around uh, 1900s, the early 1900s. Since the mid 90s, this building has housed Irish giftware shops, bookshops, and most recently, a Waterford based independent knitwear designer shop. Bavian opened its Kilkenny branch on the 30th of November 2019, a mere three months before the outbreak of the pandemic, and unfortunately suffered a similar fate to many new businesses that started around that time. The first image shows the hand painted fascia sign treasures taken from Kilkenny shop fronts through the Ages digital repository. And the second is the 2021 KTSSP audit photo. All that remains of the Bavian sign now are the pegs that once held the raised acrylic letter forms to the fascia. However, if you trace the outline and try really hard, you can perhaps discern the previous fascia letter forms. I've seen these traces of former signs throughout Ireland and wonder, are these to be our vestiges, our remnants? If the unit is reoccupied, these will most likely be removed and replaced with a new set adhered to the fascia. With no evidence of past occupiers, no ghost fascia signs, no layers, what will be the signage legacy of our times? Right next door, at number 28, is Lanigan's Bar, although not in last year's audit, as the traditional shop front is a much more recent addition. It's only one of a few instances of hand painted uh, fascia signage now evident along this uh, particular streetscape. The audit recorded only 10 from 53 shop fronts that were hand painted. This wonderful lettering was hand painted by Sauce Aliverdian, an Armenian born Kilkenny based sign writer. Undoubtedly, Lanigan's Bar is trying to convey Irishness through its choice of fascia lettering, further bol bolstered by the inclusion of gilded or gold animal illustrations that would sit happily between the pages of an illuminated manuscript. Interestingly, Gaelic letter forms in the survey accounted for a mere 3.77% in that uh, KTSSP. The A in Lanigan is very distinctive with its narrow angular counter and possibly closer in form to the Roman, Roman unseal rather than a Gaelic letter form. There's also an intriguing, I don't know if you noticed it, but positioning of the fada between the A and the E in Lanagon. 
Um, across the road at number three is DNR Antiques, and this was the only instance of black letter noted within the immediate audit area. The sign has been in place since at least 2004, which was detailed on the NIAH listing. Just around the corner um, is Godfrey Green Auctioneers with gold script hand lettered by the late Joe Quigley. Now Joe's grandson Donal is still in the trade though specialising in faux wood graining techniques rather than traditional sign writing. Moving on just beside DNR Antiques is O'Connell's Pharmacy at number four, Rosin Street. John O'Connell is the third generation of O'Connell pharmacists at this address and it was opened by his grandfather in 1945. John has run this branch since uh, 1995 and his father Michael operates um, from the High Street Pharmacy. O'Connell's Haven Pharmacy is strongly towing the corporate line in colour choice and lettering. Identified here is um, Cecilia Standard 45 light by monotype. So uniform in design that I almost mistakenly included the High Street branch in my slide. On the 23rd of the 6th at the Hills Type Trail launch this year, a lady offered her opinion on the loss of the wonderfully unique pharmacy uh, traditional shop fronts and lettering. She felt these chain pharmacies to be the primary cause of the disappearance of the vernacular chemist shop front. Although I believe this to be a con contributing factor, further research is definitely required to either prove or disprove this fact. In past years, the fascia sign was hand painted. My appraisal of the current sign on the building's facade and fascia noted, in stark contrast to the uniformity of the fascia lettering, a fine example of vernacular sign writing can be located centrally in the wall space above the first floor Georgian windows. This pharmacy lettering was hand painted by Pat Quigley, yet another member of the sign writing Quigley dynasty. When I spoke to Pat last year, he was the final practicing sign writer from this family in Kilkenny. And just to give you an idea of what it did look like before, uh, excuse the quality of the images, they're taken probably about 30 years ago, but they'll give you some kind of um, idea of what it used to look like. And this is one other fascia sign as well that I found in the archives. And so ends our walk, hand painted, decorative, Victorian inspired serif capitals with white outline on black fascia by Kilkenny based sign writer Sas Aliverdian at Tynan's Bridge House Bar to John's Bridge, otherwise known as Horseleap Slip, otherwise known as Bateman Key, renovated in 1908 with pub front inserted to the ground floor. The NIH record um, of 2004 details that this is a finely detailed pub front exhibiting high quality craftsmanship again significantly enhances the visual appeal of the street at sea, uh, street level, sorry, street scene at street level. This building is extremely important to me personally. Uniquely, this street has three names. The latter, Bateman Key, is named after my great uncle Jimmy, who lived in my maternal grandfather's home place, just a few do doors down from Tynan's. Also during the 1970s, my paternal grandfather, Johnny Dadamar, managed Tynan's Bar. And this may be the reason that I spent three days photographing the painting of the new old sign. On the data sheet, there is one striking final comment from my survey. This fine exemplar of a historic shop front is in dire need of in intervention and immediate refurbishment in order to preserve many of the original features. Fortunately, Tynan's was awarded €15,000 from the shop front stream of the Historic Structures Fund in 2021, supporting the recent refurbishment of the facade. The iconic fascia sign cracked when removed for structural repairs. Though the sign's significance in Kilkenny's visual landscape was honoured as it was reproduced letter for letter on the new fascia board, ensuring that this remains a part of the streetscape for generations to come. And as it happens, the last remaining piece of this sign was gifted to me and now proudly sits in my studio. Over the past year, I've been disseminating research via my Instagram at Signright Era. When I started on this platform, I used the tagline there is an opportunity within every fascia to cre create something wonderfully unique. 
As British type designer Matthew Carter once put it, I could be parachuted, blindfolded anywhere in the world, take off the blindfold and look around. And I could see the shop faces and the newspapers. And I would know exactly where I was just from the typeface. With typographic globalization leading to homogenization, this is no longer the case. Last year, the government introduced a pilot stream of the Historic Structures Fund for Shopfronts and Signage. And as I said, Tynan's was a deserving re recipient. Though many more signs long since offering a sense of place on our streets are literally crumbling and falling from faces around our country. For all the government initiatives introduced, there is no existing system nor specific knowledge to appraise um, to determine the value of these letters, nor are there any conservation guidelines for preserving existing signs. Streetscape initiatives have been introduced to enhance fronts and signs, yet there are a few practicing sign writers, well, in Kilkenny at least. Currently, artisans are having to travel abroad to broaden and elevate their skill set and knowledge. On a positive note, however, Ballyferma College confirmed recently to me that their sign writing course is going ahead as of this Monday, the 12th. It must be considered that not everything can be saved, but knowing what to save and how best to preserve it is a worthy endeavour. Alan Bartram speaks in terms of sensitive lettering and continues, we respond to it because it's so obviously done by a human being with human weaknesses. The street feels a more human place because of it. These unique, these unique signs are still here to be appreciated, but if they vanish, we will have lost the very soul of our towns, or so I believe. And thank you. Very much, Dee. Uh, perfect timing there as well. You were just 10 seconds <laughs> over. Uh, so that was brilliant. Um, OK, so our next speaker then is Elaine Manley of the uh, National Museum of Ireland, and her title is A New Space for Mourning Rituals. Elaine Manley is a design historian and visual designer. She is originally from Cork, but is now based in Kilkenny, another Kilkenny connection. She currently works as a researcher for the National Museum of Ireland. She completed a master's in design history and material culture in NCAD in 2020. So Elaine, I'll now call you up. Well, thank you everyone for coming today and thank you Dee, for that gorgeous presentation. I want all of those pictures. <laughs> so um, I, my name is Elaine Manley and today I'm going to be talking about the internet as a new space for morning rituals. Much of this is based on my thesis as mentioned by Mel, which I wrote in 2020 in the midst of the early days of the pandemic. And while it was a less than ideal time to be undertaking a huge amount of research, the restrictions on movement and changes in access to archives and libraries did help shape the final outcome that led me to discover an amazing area that I'm really interested in now called Tana Technology, which is a concept that links grieving to the technological world. So the internet in all its vastness is a place for the dead, from dead accounts we no longer use to those no longer active due to a user's death, all probably still receiving spam. Hamill expands, expands on this concept in Tana Technology, dying in the digital age, when considering that online immortality and digital afterlife has the potential to extend mourning indefinitely. And Tony Walter considers that the presence of the dead within society depends in part on available communication technologies, and, and that's in communication media and the dead from the Stone Age to Facebook. All of these are fantastic names. I'm just going to say <laughs> that here. And here we are. Um, this is me in the middle of the pandemic, just when we we're allowed to travel out, I think about two kilometers. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, I was on a train. Um, so COVID gave us the opportunity to observe a very unique set of circumstances where we drastically adjusted our lives. And because of times we live in, many people turn to the internet and social media, whether that was doom scrolling through Twitter or consulting TikTok about your sourdough starter, the internet facilitated our lives in a new and much more intense way, probably because we had no other option. And while this was evident before COVID, during the pandemic, it became much more apparent that as our lives are spent and shown more and more online, will our deaths and ways of grieving go there also. It's not uncommon to announce, announce both our major and mundane life events online. And whether we like it or not, death is one of the certainties of life. 
And this is a lovely uh, image from the National Gallery of Graphite and Water of a funeral procession. Um, it's from 1900, but it's something that is very evocative of Irish mourning rituals. And death rituals are ever evolving. As a society, they are enacted by encounters trauma and new ways of life and new technologies. The core reason for, for, for performing, sorry, for performing ritual, funerary rituals is to remove the dead from the place of the living, either physically or metaphorically. But this is much more than an act of disposal. Communities come together to mark the passing of one of their members. Ireland has been described as a culture with a fixation on death. And during the pandemic, habitual death rituals had to be put on pause, not just for victims of COVID-19, for just as life had to continue, so did death. Rituals had to be adapted and transformed in order to continue some form of them and to protect the living. In Cloda Tate's Death Burial and Commemoration in Ireland, um, she talks about the concept of social death as something that does not correspond with the actual moment of death. And this preludes the idea that the funeral is not actually about the deceased, rather it is about the, those who are left behind. The community performs rituals to renegotiate what life will be like without the deceased. And during the pandemic, death was distanced. But what was once a social occasion was restricted by measures such as cocooning and social distancing. This means that people could no longer come together. There was a space of two metres between, and in times of grief, this may as well have been hundreds of miles away. And we have to ask at this time, do we feel like the deceased were properly mourned? <laughs> online objects, and in this case, online memorials through the medium of the screen are part of material culture. Mayer puts forward a theory in the origin of mission, origin and mission of material culture and material religion, excuse me, that the meaning of an object is not understood to reside singularly within it but also to draw from its circulation, local adaption, from what people do with it, and from effective and conceptual schemes whereby users apprehend an object. And online objects seem to allow for infinite possibilities of circulation. They're no longer restricted by geography or time. The only barrier is an internet connection. So as our lives move online, so do our relationships and societal structures. Online objects may not exist in the material world in a physical sense, but we can still see their effect. The internet is something people react with all the time. It brings us messages, news and entertainment. The online era of material is imminent. And in the context of death, this is demonstrable by the moving of many memorials online in recent years, and notably during the coronavirus pandemic. A question that comes from this school of thought is whether online memorials will eventually replace one physical ones, and can they offer the same level of comfort as a place to return to, to memorialize someone that you have lost. And um, Miroshnichenko argues, <laughs> sorry, I practice that pronunciation. Miroshnichenko argues that contemporary media literally create reality. Beyond the task of informing, media sources permeate the lives of those that read about them. More worryingly, there's a cycle of what a user may choose to look at, perpetuated by algorithmic pressure to keep the user in position for as long as possible. And users are shown what they want to see, which may not be representative of what is actually going on. And this phenomenon was noted as far back as 1967 in the Medium is a Massage by Marshall McLuhan, where he said, ours is a brand new world of all at onceness. Time has ceased, space has vanished. As attention shift from action to reaction, we must be aware and alert. Our constant need for communication has resulted in this. Our need to check what's going on has become a daily ritual and our online presence is an integral part of our identity. Our smartphones are next to us every second of every day, incessantly buzzing and beeping and demanding to be recharged for more buzzing and beeping. Uh, even my cats have got in on it. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a case of bad parenting where I showed them those like cat TV things and now they're obsessed. <laughs> smartphones have become tethered to our lives. People no longer have to go looking for news or entertainment. Information comes to us and it fills our feeds as we mindlessly scroll and the algorithm decides what we should see based on our interests. It strengthens our convictions because our opinions are constantly backed up by what we consume. However, this can narrow our viewpoint. I would argue that this is not entirely a new phenomenon. Um, for example, news stations or newspapers uh, often have bias politically or socially, and we can choose which ones we want to consume. 
in the modern digital age with so much news on social media, news kind of becomes social media. Online divisions of newspapers can reply instantly and observe what's trending and edit quickly if needed. And so the interconnectivity between reader, writer and editor brings about a sense of interdependence. The media has to respond to users and users need the media to stay informed. So it's a cyclical system. Between the decentralization of media sources and the 24 hour information flow, information from any geographical area that may relate to topics you vaguely absorbed might appear in your feed. And information about individual and large scale death travels fast and is consumed by many. This displaces official channels ability to accurately curate the information given, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it would be if you saw a post online about the death of someone close to you before you were informed by family or those looking after your loved one. Nestled among cat videos and internet drama is a potential for the worst news you can possibly get. The immediacy of news about disasters and death doesn't give those in mourning a chance to breathe. Strangers may set up memorials before you've had a chance to co comprehend what has happened. And the virtual and physical world become one. They ricochet off one another, each perpetuating the other. The consumption of information online has become a daily ritual and is tied to our identity as people who are aware and informed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about online mourning. And when the internet or social media networks become a default destination for many to express grief and remember the deceased, it delocalizes the deceased's final resting place. Relatives and friends unable to travel for whatever reason um, are not excluded. They have a place to direct their grief. And unlike a cemetery, a virtual memorial is accessible via online connectivity at all hours of the day or night. Users can look through photos and posts and send private messages to the deceased if they want to. And they can comment and browse through pictures and old posts, which may be a way to relive memories with the deceased. It's interesting at this point to consider why people join social media networks, which is to connect to friends or family, to share information about your life, to create career opportunities, and to stay informed, among others. And people join these networks for the other people in them and because they want to be connected to those people. Anna Harju notes that memorials as a way of marking and remembering deaths are integral in rituals relating to death. Maintaining a link to individuals who have passed away is both personally and culturally important. It ensures a continued remembrance and inclusion of the deceased in the present. In this sense, memorials are like windows into the past and glimpses of a shared cultural and historical inheritance. Online memorials harbor as many meanings as their offline counterparts. However, their shareable and modifiable nature means that they emerge in new contexts and in new formats, acquiring new meanings and new audiences. So I'm now just going to talk about some encounters um, with online memorials, which I've uh, entitled the stats, the dishes and the shared. So we'll start with the stats. And now these are quite old. These were taken directly from my thesis, but um, they're clear and scientific and clean. They don't have faces beyond perhaps a newsreader or maybe even a friend showing them to you. And they were always defined whenever we wanted them. These two screenshots from August 2020 show both the daily confirmed cases in the Republic of Ireland and the more comprehensive John Hopkins University COVID dashboard on the same day. And each um, in the John Hopkins one, each section can be much more expanded and searches can be customized as opposed to the Irish one. And if you were to look at these graphs today, uh, because they are still up there, I did check, uh, the numbers would be much higher, but the number of people vaccinated would also have been added. Alongside uh, images such as these were the seditious report, were secreted, sorry, recordings of reality, the reality of COVID and mass death. Images such as Italian army vehicles carrying coffins and long lines through the streets of Bergamo when local cemeteries became overwhelmed are emotional and almost claustrophobic. It felt like COVID-19 could not be escaped. You have to think of the context of when we were receiving them during the pandemic. Here is a still from a YouTube video that emerged in March 2020, so very early. And the fact this act was done through the night and video footage from residents made the rounds on social media and news stations is also overwhelming. It's something you could see both on official sources and your WhatsApp groups. 
And in an age of mass communication, there's so much to wade through and some sources with difficult language to understand. Each piece of advice was politicized and worst of all, we were addicted to reading and watching and discussing it all. So this seems like a good time to look at shared encounters of death. And I'm doing this through a series of uh, Google search screenshots. Uh, so death rituals were both disrupted and transformed during the pandemic. Some of the infrastructure for alternative methods uh, were already in place, and but it was being embraced on a much larger scale. And new ways to honor the disease also appeared, showing innovation and resolve not to abandon funerary rituals. The spaces where these rituals are carried out continue to shift and evolve. This has expanded online to social media and new forms of material memorials. In social support, interworks, caskets for sale and more, TANA technology and the information superhighway, Carla Sofka uses the term TANA technology to discover the union of death and technology. As such, it could be supposed that this is a new form of mourning entirely and not a replacement for traditional forms. And the pandemic made these technological forms of grieving essential for the continuation of expressing and sharing grief. I'll just change slide there. Grieving and death rituals are vital to the continuation of a community after death. And these are an indispensable aspect of post-death care, that is the caring of those left behind. By observing the various motions of memorialization during this time, we may get a sense of what new methods and rituals will be possible in the future. When restrictions were first imposed and funeral, funeral, sorry, funeral attendees reduced to 10 and were raised then to 25 and 50 people, the ritual itself was never banned, highlighting its cultural and for some spiritual importance. Comparing the images, I'll just go to a slide that does compare them. Comparing the images of absent crowds is evident. In the first image on the top left, <laughs> sorry. Um, in the first image, um, uh, a screenshot of the Google search Irish funeral, we see crowded churches, long processions, and many people at the gravesite. In the countless images of Irish political funerals, such as Michael Collins or Terence McSweeney, we see the spectators gathered to honor or heroes or those people we find important. And it is probably safe to say in a few weeks, we will see the same for Queen Elizabeth II. Um, and, but even in the cases of ordinary people, there is always a speculation of whether or not it will be a large funeral. It influences what part of the ritual people attend, as opposed to easily get to the chief mourners to express sympathy and get out again. What often influences the size of a funeral is the circumstances of a death, uh, tragedy also bring, always brings a large crowd and the position of the deceased, particularly in local groups and how large a family they had also influences this. And instead of crowds in our second image, Irish funeral COVID-19, um, we see distance mourning, which effectively distances people from death rituals. The haunting swell of applause as hearses pass you and the smatterings of songs uh, bring tears to the eyes of all who hear it. And guards of honour are often seen at funerals, but none like this, none so restricted. Death remains part of us because it's a part of life, but it must be asked, does the absence of community correlate with the absence of ritual? And if our presence is so important to the funeral, and I personally would argue that it is, we had to find a different way of being present. So that would be my third slide here of Zoom funerals. So some funerals are streamed online for those who wish to view the ceremony and it brings family together, but viewing people through a screen reminds you that you're not at their side. The familiar little motions of mourning like clasping hands and hugging are impossible. The grid of familiar faces or camera pointed at the sealed coffin of someone you knew is strange yet quickly becoming the norm. As seen in the third screenshot with Zoom funerals um, <laughs> that we have here, of course, most of these technologies and infrastructures were already in place before the pandemic, but it was only when death was highly visible that these means were on, often an extension, a tenuous equivalent of previous methods of mourning and saw an adaption and uptake on a mass scale. Of course, recording funerals for those of national importance is not new, but it is also common for private send-offs. But a huge Irish diaspora returning home for funerals is not easy, and streaming online or recording recognises the human need to see the ritual uh, for personal acts of mourning and overall well-being as a grieving person. 
And in the midst of the worldwide pandemic, recording funerals was not a choice or a nice extra for those who cannot attend. It was essential if we wanted to sustain a ritual of community involvement in a funeral. Limitations on numbers attending funerals and people unable to leave their homes because of travel restrictions, quarantines or cocooning have ruptured the traditional funeral ritual. An undertaker who held up their phone to record a service at a graveside described what was on, a, what was on the screen as he did so. I could see them watching. They had taken the time to dress up in a coat and tie. It's a little gesture. That's what a funeral is, gestures. And to speak very briefly about the social media phenomenon. Um, it could be said that our, lives, our social lives and our social media are becoming notably interchangeable. New technology opens up new dialogues and intimacy with strangers. The internet is anonymous until it isn't. We choose to reveal ourselves and we choose to share our lives online. As sections of our lives become established online, with connections that would be near impossible in any other form, so too must or deaths. Connections we make online deserve to be informed and to be offered the chance to grieve, rather than witness a sudden loss in contact and never know why. And this often happens in the online gaming world. Uh, many in-game shrines have appeared over the years as more people interact with the world and more people can have some sort of connection with those who have passed. User-driven memorials also take place. And in July 2020, a large group uh, gathered their avatars in a specific place to honor the passing of a player known as Wreckful. Images of the gathering are as moving as a large crowded in-person funeral. These for this form of media becomes a tool for externalizing and recording sympathy or empathy across geographical, cultural, social, and interpersonal divisions. And people came from many servers from all over the world and paid respects to some they never even met in person. And this is a screenshot of a tweet uh, for the memorial where large groups of avatars gathered. Messages of condolences and support were posted publicly. And for someone who people who attended the memorial could only have met online, it was a very fishing location. Similar memorials have appeared in Animal Crossing New Horizons, with users creating virtual grave sites for loved ones who have passed. And many of them are for people who died during COVID, but also um, there are memorials for people who died before that users wanted to include in this new world they were creating. And to elaborate on an online memorial created specifically for those who've died during the pandemic, we can look to a virtual memorial wall launched by RTE. Working with undertakers around the country, they have a, curated a website that allows families to pay tribute to and remember loved ones called Ireland Remembers. In the wall of names um, on a background of dark navy and pale gold letters, the names float slowly across the screen. The serif lettering stands out and is reminiscent of names carved into headstones and inlaid with gold. The user may search by name, county or review an A to Z list. And when you click a name, the new screen, which is a screenshot here, um, I didn't want to include any names in this presentation. Um, it gives you a virtual candle lighting option, a ritual that's often performed by individuals in churches or in their own homes. And they come as close as possible to recreating the feeling of being in a church when you're doing it, the sort of familiar dim and dusty corners. And the user may click or tap the candle to light it. You may only light one per visit to each memorial screen. And the interactive elements allow users to transform from passive observers to active participants in memorial activities. Virtual objects such as these candles have become materials of grief. And could it be said then that the need to mark a loss is an inherent to the human condition and that even if we make new rituals or adapt old ones, we must recognize death in some way. Online communities are virtual meeting places where people with common interests, feelings and ideals come together to share emotions and gain a sense of belonging uh, that is missing from their lives. To want to connect is to be human. And even if that is facilitated by a machine, though there may be no physical touch, it can be described as touching. Though not made of any visible material, the effects are palpable. And of course, there is always a question of is this the right thing to do or are we doing it in the right way? And rituals are always changing as new way, there are new ways of material emerging um, all the time. Through new rituals, we have preserved some of the traditions of Irish death culture. They may be altered, but they are just as important to the community. 
We found new ways to mourn and the combination of old and new mourning could revolutionize how we remember our dead. Online memorials are still somewhat in their infancy, but the pandemic increased our awareness of this, this infrastructure and brought about huge potential for future projects. It reminds us that the old ways have always been changing because people are always changing. So we've shed the comfort of the way, old ways that we've always done it. It connects us to our ancestors in that the dead are still have a place in our society. But when an online funeral looks the same as a Zoom meeting from work or those attempts at Zoom meetings and meetups with friends, you have to consider the boundaries. For, for example, where do you sit for an, an online funeral? In the office, in the cafe, the kitchen table, in bed? Who's with you? Is anyone? Can we relive a funeral and watch it all over again, like our favourite Netflix show? And this blending of the online and offline world by no means limits the need for a physical place or keepsake to mourn and remember the person who has passed. And if these do not exist, it could mean a significant part of our loved one's lives may be lost to us. And can a computer's memory facilitate our collective remembering? And yet yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I immediately pressed the wrong one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. And now we have our final speaker, and that is Istvan Laszlo of Dublin City University. Uh, Istvan is looking at interactive monuments in the digitally mediated city, examining the potential of digital objects in physical space. Istvan Laszlo is currently a PhD candidate in the School of Communications at Dublin City University. His research analyzes the social and spatial impact of digital media technologies in urban space. Istvan previously obtained a master's degree in digital art from the National College of Art and Design, NCAD Dublin in 2019. And Istvan, I'll never call you up. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks very much for having me. So uh, my name is Istvan Laszlo and uh, I'm an artist and uh, uh, currently a PhD candidate. And so um, basically I have a, a background in traditional sculpture and then I moved towards uh, film production, uh, sound design and then digital art. I spent a couple of years doing conceptual art and exhibited um, internationally. And then I was kind of slowly gravitating towards um, what is the idea of, of a digital object, uh, a spatial or volumetric object in a digital form, and how that relates to um, uh, older kind of formats of monumentality and, and how we can uh, perform or interact with them um, in cont with contemporary technology in urban space. So um, basically, first of all, if we look at what is a digital object, so um, the philosopher Yu Kui describes uh, digital objects as uh, a new form of industrial object, which pervades every aspect of our life. Uh, and they're in their simplest form, there are text messages, images, videos, social media profiles. And in more complex form, there are composite data models. So this idea of a uh, composite data model kind of brings me closer to the idea of sculpture. And basically we have uh, two sets of, 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 of models really, representational models and knowledge models. And representational models are really used in visual culture mainly. And then knowledge models are basically to do more with, with science. But we use models and the idea of model kind of culturally is, is a little bit underrated kind of cultural tool. Um, and so I would like to kind of compare a little bit of a history of monuments, how they relate to a performance or interaction in urban space and how it translates to digital objects. So I'm going to start with this uh, very strange image and I would have to say that um, 
figurative uh, sculpture. It's kind of an outdated way of thinking about monumentality, especially in the Western world. Yet in many parts of the world, uh, you could see really large, large scale monuments. And they feel really, really kind of misplaced in a way. So in this slide, you see uh, a monument which is uh, 49 meters tall. It's in Dakar, Senegal. And what's interesting about it is that uh, it's created by a North Korean studio, which basically um, does two things. They do exports of massive uh, monumental figurative statues, mainly to Africa, and then they create propaganda material within the country. But what they do is kind of the reason why I'm very interested, because I did uh, when I studied art, I did a very similar kind of approach to uh, I started in communism in Romania and I did uh, all the way up until my 20s. I studied art and it was the same kind of model of kind of learning how to create propaganda material, even though this wasn't anymore in communism, but all the teachers and all the systems were still in place and it was very hard to kind of change them quickly. So. This kind of brings me to uh, the idea of what are virtual 3D objects in relation to monuments and the copies and variations that exist within monuments. <clears throat> so because basically when we think of digital files, uh, we think of this inherent quality that we can just copy them without loss of um, loss of data. Yet there isn't this idea of data erosion. But anyway, we think of like infinite copies that are perfectly the same. And then if we look at the idea of sculpture, really of monumental sculpture, in which we have traditionally three, um, three kind of formats that persisted throughout the, the centuries, it's the equestrian statue, the column, or the figurative single figure or group statues. And so here you see a statue made by John Henry Foley, the Irish uh, sculptor, which still has five monuments in the city. Uh, and basically, this statue of uh, Sir James Outram was unveiled in mid 1800s. And currently, there's still, well, used to be four copies of this statue, uh, with one being removed uh, in 2020 with the civil rights movement in the States. And so, in this next slide, you see the four variations. And basically, this tradition, the first slide is, is just 20 years from the unveiling of the original statue. And the first image is from uh, Kathmandu. The second one is in Kolkata, where the original uh, Henry Foley statue was placed. And what happens here is basically they change the, the, the rider from the horse. And with this, they kind of use the same kind of established visual format that presented a political leader or th the symbol of power. And they kind of replace it just for the audiences to kind of continue on with a replaced idea of someone that fits better the social or political climate. Then the third slide is from Richmond and it was removed in 2020. It has an interesting story because it's also an Irish sculptor who made a copy of the Henry Foley statue. Uh, and after he won the competition, uh, he was asked to make changes to the statue because it was they figured it's too similar to the original. So that's how you can see. That's the reason why you can see the little differences between the original kind of pose of the horse. And then the last one is the most recent one from 2019 from um, made by Kahinda Wiley. And again, is this response to taking a previous symbol of power and just replacing the rider and having something that really fits in with the current social and political climate. And yet, so as we look at these variations, sculptural variations and kind of the representations of power, virtual 3D objects now can kind of contain all this information, historical information in a, in a digital form. So these are very complex processes which can be obtained in two ways. You can do it photographically, so you get a volumetric model through photogrammetry, or you do scanning as long as the object exists. And so here within these uh, images, there is a, a, a slide or an image of Marcus Aurelius, uh, which is here. So you can encounter it like this in the Capitoline Hill in Rome, yet this is a copy as well. Now, if you look at how it can be accessed on, on an online platform, which is Sketchfab, you can kind of 
interact with this with this object and this is obtained by photogrammetry as well but actually these objects are really complex uh, um, forms of recording a physical object okay so it's a combination between three dimensional images and volumetric data which is also calculated from the distance of the camera and the object by hundreds hundreds of points and so it's basically a virtual 3D module is merging ideas of photography to two dimensional image making that tradition and the tradition of sculpture. And so as uh, especially in the pandemic, this this idea of making a fragile historical object uh, accessible to the public. Uh, was kind of highlighted by the pandemic, so museums started to put their uh, scans of fragile objects onto these platforms to make it accessible for the public, for students to study or to download and actually 3D print, because there is a bridge through uh, 3D printing that you get the intangible data of an object and you basically 3D print it. OK, so it's no longer this idea of, uh, of an intang intangible structure. It becomes very, very physical as well. And so another uh, kind of last way of um, of kind of encountering these monuments uh, throughout my research was through Google Street View, Google Earth and vid video gaming. So which I really call these as like digital hyper objects they are really large and complex structures. But the thing with a video game is that sculpture becomes very modular. So only the real important outstanding monuments are depicted as singular objects. The rest of them are copied. So anyway, to kind of conclude this idea of, or like this historical overview of monuments, virtual 3D objects and um, how they developed. So around the time when the John Henry Foley uh, statue that I showed earlier was unveiled, this is a US patent uh, made by Francois Wilhelm for a process called photo sculpture. OK, so this was the earliest attempt to try to combine photography and sculpture to produce objects uh, in kind of a, on an industrial scale. And then uh, 100 years later, you have from the University of Utah, you have uh, Ivan um, Sutherland's VW uh, Beetle scan. But basically what they've done with his students, they drew a wireframe structure onto the car. It was his wife's car. And they kind of lay down this blueprint of how we process three dimensional objects within a computer. And then the other slide is Martin Newell's Utah teapot. And actually an Irish artist, Alan Butler, uh, made a physical version, which you can see in uh, Smithfield right now. OK. And so that kind of leads me on to the public interaction or how I like to call them interferences with monuments. And I must say I really um, I'm fascinated by this form of uh, public performance that happens with uh, the, the public really uh, doing this visceral or very energetic performance and how they express them, themselves in regards to these monuments. And because especially um, it's nothing to do that much with materiality, but what they really represent. And so um, I was following this because about 20 years ago, I witnessed one of these events in Eastern Europe. And since then, I'm following the, the removal, of, uh, removal of monuments. So here you see a couple of slides from the uh, removal of Confederate monuments um, in the States in 2020. But then another form of kind of interaction with these monuments, you can see the Soviet army monument in Bulgaria, which has this um, um, kind of history of being repainted, cleaned, repainted. So it's basically becomes a canvas for public uh, expression. And and this this is still an ongoing thing. Um, so it's not really limited to physical removal. And then these are some some that I, I witnessed. I mean, uh, one from these. And so this is happening for the last 30 years, the, the removal of Soviet statues in Eastern Europe. And then because I was doing my research here in Dublin, I looked at the history of, of Dublin and the removal of um, colonial statues, which is Dublin has an amazing history for that. So it's only four images. There are six in total and they are really, really large public performances that happened. And um, so I, I tackled this problem through my practical components and 
what I've done because I started my research in 2019, the pandemic started, so I didn't have access to these locations to go out and visit them. So I did most of my um, research about the locations online through Google Maps and Street View. And I tried to, to kind of lay down a route uh, in which um, people can navigate and kind of witness these sites. And so this is after the uh, travel restrictions were lifted. So I walked this, this kind of path a couple of times to kind of see how much time it takes and uh, what is really the encounter with that physical space, okay? And once you see those locations or see those images where those monuments used to be, you actually go to a site uh, where these kind of digital ghosts exist. Something is really kind of missing from that place. I'm not here to make the argument that things shouldn't be removed. Those things being removed, it's part of the history of, of a city, and I think it's it's a fascinating thing. But again, because I because they are removed, I couldn't use photogrammetry or scanning to recreate uh, these these monuments to do a performative kind of interactive uh, piece with them. But I found the images in the National uh, Library's archive for almost every every statue, uh, and they have an amazing digitized uh, version of the photo archive. But these are the images that really stuck with me. So you see, this is basically it's almost like a, a monumental public art installation. Okay, so you have the 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 monument which is being cleared. Uh, by trucks and personnel of the city, and you have the, it's surrounded by this, the spectators, okay, who witness this public kind of performance. So I think this is a, a fascinating thing, and it's it's an ephemeral event. It it ends, and only the people who actually been there in that time uh, kind of see this. So that's what kind of led me on to this uh, journey of kind of trying to trans transform the photographic data into volumetric data and to try to make um, make some form of uh, practice based uh, performance so the public can witness these uh, events. So this is the uh, uh, Lord Carlisle in uh, Phoenix Park. And so um, basically I do need to rebuild these in order to make them available to the public. I need to rebuild them almost like restore them first before I can destroy them again to make it available for the public. So basically, this, this makes my role as both the sculptor of the monuments uh, and also the public in a sense who are going who are going through and destroying the piece, okay? And then making it available to the public. So, but ultimately my desire really is to make it available for the public and to see uh, how, they, how they experience this event. Um, so, just to give you a, a bit of a sense of how this process works, um, this is, I extracted kind of this photogrammetry data from photographs. It's very limited because um, it's kind of reverse engineering a certain technology, but it gives you a good idea, proportional idea of what the object was like. And then this is more closer to what I ended up. Of course, I had to use my sculpture skills and transformed or kind of like apply them in a digital way to make this kind of reconstruction. And then finally, then it's, it's to kind of based on the photographic data to kind of recreate this scene where the monument was fallen. Um, so these are the six monuments. I really don't have the time to kind of go into all of them. Uh, they're all really kind of very different performances. But the monuments are, uh, the first one is King William III, uh, which used to be in College Green, King George II from um, Simmons Green, Carlisle from uh, Phoenix Park, um, the O'Connell Street Monuments of Nelson, um, Lord Gough, and Queen Victoria, which now is in Melbourne. And so these are some of the planning of the, the application that will be it's basically a window through your smartphone that you go to a location and you encounter this this basically this um installation this digital installation but to kind of to to gauge or see it sounds good as an idea but to see how it can work i made the test in rha last year and so basically uh, i chose the uh, king george the second uh, basically because of the proximity or its original location, which was Stevens Green. And also using these kind of elements of the pandemic 
of uh, everyone was much more familiar with the QR codes than ever before. It, it seemed to be like uh, one of those, another one of those mediums that's just going to die out. But suddenly it was in use. So I decided to, instead of using any kind of other images, I planted this uh, QR code in the middle of the traditional images from which the viewers then can go, trigger the object, the object appears in the exhibition space, and then they can navigate the space and have an experience with the object. So these are some of the captures that I made. And actually, the very interesting thing that I didn't plan for was this idea that I can act, someone else can actually view another person with the object in a digital space, which actually made me think very differently about the role of this digital layer that we now encounter in public space and what kind of role artists or other creatives uh, need to take or what responsibility do we have to take claim uh, of this space, of this another layer, or are we going to allow it to become a commercial space? Can it be both a commercial and a cultural space or will it just be owned by Meta, Facebook or some other company? So this was kind of my journey to kind of figure out how this works. And uh, I'll show you a bit of a footage of how this recording works. And of course, the, the object is very glitchy. There is a certain amount of detail you can you can kind of fit into your restricted by the capacity, the um, processor of of the best uh, smartphone. OK, so it doesn't matter what a detail detailed object you make, you're always going to be restri restricted to how the technology kind of scales. But the encounter was very interesting. It doesn't take into account other objects and things like this yet. It's kind of sensitive to people, so people can walk through it and it tries to calculate that thing. And also it, it creates this, this digital phantom that you encounter. So of course you don't see it in physical space, but you see it through this window of the, of the phone perfectly kind of overlaid in public space. So this ex uh, experiment kind of, um, it kind of encouraged me to to place these uh, installations in the original locations throughout the city. And I still have kind of like a year to, to do this process. So this is where I am. Um, this is the QR code of the um, statue that I exhibited in the RHA for the participant testing. So you can take an image and you can trigger it wherever you want, if you like. Uh, and that's really it. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, just to throw it open to the floor, um, do we have any questions for three speakers? Yes, I'm happy to get. Great stuff, yeah. Great stuff. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm interested in something that seems to be present across your paper but also seems to be present across much of the context, which is uh, even though our topic is post-pandemic space, forward and ahead, yeah. so in order to address that topic, we are constantly in need of turning back to history, memory, and nostalgia, and, and, and mourning. And I just, you know, I don't know why, why that is. Maybe that's, maybe that's the moment history always plays, but I don't know if that's something um, that you have any, any thoughts on, you know, what, what if we get right to the tech, um, uh, certainly there's a lot of memory in what we're always we're talking about, but there's also, there's also a nostalgia, there's, there's a desire to hang on to something that is the object of your study. So like with the signs, for instance, I was really interested, just on a personal level, to know where did your connection with signs begin? Mm -hmm. How did you become interested in that? Because it seems to be you know, academic, intellectual, and social, cultural, but also deep in person. Uh, my dad is a retired painter and decorator. Uh, he would have done a sign writing element uh, when he did his apprenticeship back in the 60s. Uh, I watched him as, as a child and a teen actually page signs, but uh, I suppose they died out to some extent, like hand painted signs died out to some extent um, with the advance of technology, printed vinyls. Um, and unfortunately, that element of his uh, craft as such uh, just went by the wayside because of technology. And I suppose that kind of almost stuck with me. 
um, you know, it's almost kind of seen it as part of, I suppose it is a personal uh, story, but also part of the heritage of the Kenny that gave it defined its character. Um, with the influx of like chain stores and that I I can remember coming home from Scotland in around 10, 2010 and walking up the high street in Kilkenny and just noticing that uh, it really struck me that I could be in any high street in the UK because you had your Argos, you had your boots, you had your so and that made me examine that further and that feeling of Unease about my hometown, but you know, it's been good so dear. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it, it was always there, but I, I think maybe the pandemic to a certain degree, when we were kind of, uh, we became more inward looking, we were confined within our areas. So, we maybe looked at, well, for me anyway, personally, I looked at what's around me in a different light and then maybe appreciated it a bit more. And, thought about it on a deeper level and what does it actually mean? Um, so I, I don't know about you guys who are in the show. I don't know if that answered it, Christoph, sorry. No, I'm just yeah. interested yeah. to hear you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought it was interesting, you know, that you could see the impact, you know, the pandemic had on your actual way to conduct your research, you know, in through as well. And so I suppose it's just kind of, it's, I don't speak for the panel, sorry, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry, please. Yeah, and then we'll yeah, look. exactly that the way, like I would have done being, you know, in the midst of the decade of centenaries, I would have fun to look at our political feelings, but then I just noticed all of these changes happening around me as I was looking into you know, what was actually happening at the moment. And then I found that that was much more interesting. And although a little bit hard to and uh, keep track of, I suppose it's always hard to do uh, research on something that's happening as you're researching it and changing every day. And uh, for example, if I look at my thesis now, it was written in 2020. There are a lot of things that I would say probably wouldn't have said that I had a written it in hindsight as opposed to written writing it at the time or you know, at the time that I wrote it. So um, yeah, it's nice to revisit. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you're saying that it's they all feel nostalgic and um, maybe, or maybe as we're talking, I, I think maybe we, um, a better way of trying to articulate it is that there's um, there's either a sense of loss or or a worry about loss that seems to come up in so many things. Well, I was thinking, I don't, from my perspective, anyway, it seemed that I was faced with with this idea of of training for something that's absolutely relevant in my early 20s. So I spent, since I was 10 year old until I was 20, I trained in a craft that was completely relevant. And I said to myself, okay, well, what can I do with this, with, with this kind of knowledge that I acquired? It was very difficult. And then I started thinking about what is this kind of resistance uh, adapting new forms visual media or understanding the world, you know? And so then I started gravitating towards the idea of the digital and not being so resistant towards it, you know? And there also this the idea of remediation that each um, visual language format kind of carries or first proves that it's capable to do something that the previous one did, like photography did with painting, so those kind of virtual 3D objects with sculpture, or this is kind of, you can think in this way in every single medium, you know? And so, so then, I don't know, I was kind of also thinking that I missed out uh, around the time of web design and uh, the internet. I was very young and I didn't really understand what's going on and I didn't really have a role in it. So now I'm thinking more that, okay, this is uh, another, a really big change that it's, it's going really, really aggressively towards us and this kind of digital uh, public space. And I'm thinking that it is maybe time to kind of address this, but using this idea of remediation, I'm trying to use old monuments to kind of test how that kind of participation can work rather than using Pokemon Go's or something like that. So I'm trying to find something that it's, 
fits in that narrative of the historical evolu evolution of this kind of um, craft or art or public interaction. You know, so that's kind of my perspective on it. Very good. I think we had another hand. Yes. Question. I have a question on the digital. Um, when you were doing that study, did you notice a big change between how people were mourning digitally before the pandemic? Is that how they how they were expressing it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose grief in itself is another very huge topic here in the PSI conference. But um, I suppose the way that people express, if you look at, say, the oral production, like an Irish example, people do normally say the same kind of things. It's an online format where you can put them in a few different ways. And it is very quite brief. Um, and I suppose like the online does allow for a larger expansion of that, but it's something that's probably still in its infancy in some states cases, and then in others that have been established for a long time. For example, um, I suppose with Facebook memorials, which is we have been around for quite a while, and turning the Facebook page into a memorial page, and uh, that was kind of first noticed in Virginia Tech when the, after the families asked for their Facebook accounts to remain. Not exactly active, but to remain online so that they could revisit them. But then, of course, the question is who gets to decide that? Is it the person who owns the account originally? Is it the person who's related to them? Is it the company themselves? If there's a really, they have a lot of research being done on that, but I wouldn't give a lot of answers. Uh, just uh, just one Take you up correctly there, you said your, your actual thesis was shaped out by the actual pandemic that you, you had. Definitely. Very interesting. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, um, I just find it really interesting if you're able to something that is completely gone, especially if you're more in the process of doing these actors. That's kind of really good. Yeah. But you know, it's very beyond going and the idea that you can relive that and experience history in the place that it's happening as opposed to say in the museum where that you show the one with the land. But what you call it not really the the Lenin <laughs> the yeah. Lenin thing. <laughs> I don't know how you just think of it, which was fascinating, I suppose it's better than one. But you know, it's a really interesting idea to experience it in the place. How did you find when people were in the world of Jay experiencing it? I was thinking about the, the fact that they actually spend more time with an object like that than a traditional piece of art, which is a couple of seconds, you know, or maybe a minute at best, and you want to the next, next, next. But it was such a different kind of experience. So each person brings a different choreography. Uh, some people go really, really close. And so if you don't see the object they're looking at, it, it is really bizarre how people act and they move around the place and then move it up and, it, and basically also kind of attracts attention. So it becomes this pretty strange, uh, minimal kind of dance piece that someone does there without you knowing what's going on. You know? So so that kind of adds this element of, of like a very physical element to something that is so intangible in, in that kind of uh, presentation. You know? yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you see this aspect of like you have to recreate something in order to dismantle it. Previous, I was thinking it's, it's the only advantage of this that once the models are done and before I take them apart, then I can donate it to a library, which then makes it accessible for the public. And someone who reads history, they can go to the library each online, check and see how that object was in current state. And so, the kind of what's novel about what I'm doing is that. I didn't have the opportunity to scan these objects. I couldn't use any existing technology, which is photographically of scanning because the model is not there. So I had to kind of reverse engineer the ways these technologies are made to create this object as accurate as possible. So uh, because, I mean, it is in development right now, and it's kind of insane where we are technologically really of how, like, I don't know if you follow Midjourney and Dolly and the image creation, all of that. This applies from NVIDIA created or um, this this technology where on a single image in a couple of second, seconds calculates a three-dimensional object science. It doesn't know how to do the parts that can be seen. 
but it makes a very, very scary good estimation, you know? And so this is happening now in a couple of years, it's gonna be so advanced. So my concern is really about like, how do you want to be only spectators of this playing out or do you, do you want to take a role in how this is shaping up in the next 10 years? So um, also it's, it's a mode of recording, right? So this place that you go, you go to the physical place so you can't access it any other way um, in that experience, only in a physical sense. So you go to this location and then you take out your little smart window and you look at it in that kind of spatial aspect. So that's how kind of you breach the past and present together through this performance. Very good. Uh, very interesting to see the threads from there you're being picked up on again. I, I just wanted to uh, ask you, D. Um, I kind of picked up a little, uh, so we all did a little bit of pessimism there to sort of say in your, your presentation in terms of you know, your sense of loss. And it's just, I guess, we're looking in Kenny, like a very familiar with Kenny. I was actually in that Cafe Nero there a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was worried I was going to appear in your photo. Um, but um, you know, from the outside looking at Kilkenny, you kind of have a sense of there's great kind of uh, pride in Kilkenny's heritage. It's you know, great archaeological work that's being undertaken in that city. Um, you know, and just in terms of you know your hopes in terms of your own research uh, and what it can can feed into. Uh, well, I'm currently working with Kilkenny County Council, yeah. um, using the same methodology that's devised for the KTSSB last year. And um, it's going to be applied in uh, another town that that's had already been agreed. Um, so the hope is by actually meeting with the forward planning department and the heritage um, officer, uh, the hope would be to actually try and kind of bed this in um, into their policies um, and what they're devising policies around signage around shopfronts at the moment. So I'd hope that I would be party to those discussions. Um, yeah, because I think it's, it's really important to actually be in there in, in with the council because at the moment they're the ones that determine what actually goes up there. But on the face of it, you would have to wonder that as well. Uh, and you can see what's on the street. But yeah, I think by working closely with the councils um, or the council and actually testing the methodology further afield uh, to capture, uh, I suppose, different exemplars of signage and that that will actually widen it, but hopefully I'll, I'll try and test it and validate it on a wider scale. Watch that space. Watch that space. <laughs> Very yeah. good, excellent. Uh, do we have Thanks. a question? Do you have a final comment or, or question? I think we, I think we let you off the hook, guys. Uh, listen, just, just, I think we should appreciate the, the three presentations.